Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Masa al khair. Nurahib bikum. We warmly welcome all of you. I can see that there's many old friends greeting each other here this evening, very special friends. I, of, I often begin my remarks here at AUC by remembering, especially for those who are visiting from outside, that this is a special country at a very special time, and tonight is a very special evening. We're particularly privileged this evening not only to welcome our very distinguished speaker and guest of honor, Ms. Lubna Olian, uh, whom this year's Nadia Yunus Award recipient, uh, Omar Hassan Zeki, who just graduated, will introduce in a few minutes. But we also have so many other distinguished guests and friends from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, from Lebanon, and from points well beyond. Among our many very dear guests this evening are the members and the friends of the Yunus family who have made this evening possible with their generous support, their love for the martyred stateswoman Nadia Yunus, and their commitment to advance her life's work and her vision for a better world. Ms. Olian, we are delighted that so many board members of your philanthropic foundation, Al Fanar, which was founded in memory of the late visionary Tariq bin Halim, also are with us. I know you had your board meeting here the past few days, and thank you so many of your board members for coming and for the great work that you do. Um, like Al Fanar and, and yourself, we at AUC are dedicated to public service and to entrepreneurship. I hope you'll share a few words with us in your remarks about Al Fanar's great story and the work you're doing. Um, one characteristic of, of AUC's educational philosophy, our, our brand of, of teaching and learning and research, is that we strive to take our students beyond the classroom, beyond their books, and out into the real world to engage in debates, discussions on critical issues, but also service, direct service, hands-on experiential learning. And we do this both at the local levels and at the global levels. And that's really the context, I think, in which we're uh, gathering here this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining as we commemorate the lasting legacy of Nadia Yunus here at the American University. This is the 12th anniversary of the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lectures. Her commitment to serving the global community embodies our ideals here at AUC, and it stands as an example to inspire our up-and-coming uh, young leaders. Representing the Yunus family here this evening is Ms. Nahed Yunus, who is the sister of the late uh, Nadia Yunus. Please join me in welcoming Nahed to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Olayan, President Ricciardoni, honored guests and students, thank you all for joining us this evening. I am deeply honored to welcome Ms. Olayan as our 10th speaker to the Nadia Yunus Annual Memorial Lecture. Ms. Olayan has a most distinguished career in the world of business and finance in Saudi Arabia and is a prominent figure on the global economic stage. She has wide and varied business interests in Egypt and is closely associated with AUC. We, the Yunis family, are delighted that she is with us today. Looking around at events in both the region and beyond, I think it is fair to say that we are living in ter interesting times, if not to say turbulent ones. It often feels as though we are at a crossroads in the region, with new dynamics and alignments forming. The Nadia Yunus Memorial Fund has traditionally invited speakers from the world of international relations and global affairs. However, we are now consciously venturing further afield in search of speakers that reflect the increasingly complex world we live in today. This world is becoming multidisciplinary, multitasking, and with no clear-cut divisions between fields anymore. As such, we feel that Ms. Olayan's inclusion as speaker is an excellent step in this direction. We aim to bring you more speakers 
who can shine a light on how to improve the future of our region. This memorial fund remains very important to the Eunice family. I understand that the room that has been donated in Nadia's name for use by MUN students remains very active. We are also happy to report that the monetary prize given twice a year to the two best graduating political science students is highly regarded. The most re recent recipient of this award is Mr. Omar Zaki, whom we congratulate heartily. We are very happy that our partnership with AUC has been a success, as we feel that the university is a first-rate venue for our fund, and we look forward to many more years of collaboration. I would especially like to congratulate President Richard Doni on his appointment two years ago to the post of AUC president. We are very grateful for the time and effort he has devoted to the fund in general, and to this lecture in particular and we thank him for that. And lastly, our thanks go to all the AUC team that has put together today's event. It is much appreciated. We would like to highlight the particular contribution of Mrs. Manar Ayoub, who has been handling our events for the past few years. Now I will hand you over to Omar Zaki, the recipient of this year's prize. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am honored and humbled to be speaking in front of you today at such a momentous event as the recipient of the Nadia Yunus Humanitarian Award for Humanitarian and Public Service. But let's take a step back and take a look at the root of the issue at hand. Humanitarian service is inherently a recognition of privilege, and it's only through said recognition that any meaningful progress can ever take place. Poverty is the main reason public and humanitarian service exists to begin with with approximately 800 million people living underneath the international poverty line. And ladies and gentlemen, the solution to poverty remains ever so simple, the empowerment of women. It is only through the empowerment of women that we can ever have a sustainable future for progress. Nevertheless, these aspirations cannot in come into fruition without a powerful inspiration. A woman that is willing to persevere and overcome all possible hurdles ahead that are put in place by institutions or structures that are designed to not let her succeed. And our guest speaker for tonight is no stranger to this, laying down the blueprint so that others can aspire to take up this mantle and provide the groundwork for more to come. Becoming the first woman to join the board of a publicly listed Saudi company where she currently serves as the vice chair of Alawal Bank, a trustee of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, chair of Alfanar, the first venture philanthropy organization working exclusively in the Arab world. Accordingly, she was named by Forbes as one of the world's 100 most powerful women in 2016 and 2017, as well as Time Magazine's 2005 list of the world's most influential people. Our guest for tonight has also been the recipient of numerous awards, including an honorary doctor of law from Trinity College Dublin, and the insignia member first class of the Royal Order of the Polar Star by the King of Sweden. Holding a Bachelor of Science from Cornell University and an MBA from Indiana University, she serves as a board member of several key organizations, including Schlumberg, Maiden, and the Down Syndrome Charitable Organization. Additionally, she serves on several key international advisory boards, including Agbank, Alliance, McKenzie and Company, and the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. And now, without further ado, please join, in, join me in welcoming our guest speaker for this evening, CEO and Deputy Chairman of Alayan Financing Company, Ms. Lobna Soleiman Alayan. Thank you, Omar, for this introduction. And thank you, Nahid, for the introduction. And uh, your excellencies, I, I was looking here and I found out I have big shoes to fill here tonight. So I, I will try my best. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
and uh, good evening, Dr. Richard Rooney, members of the faculty, students, and esteemed guests. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here with you this evening. When Nahed Yunus asked me to speak in an event honoring her sister Need Nadia, I was really, really honored. I did not have the pleasure of knowing uh, Nadia personally, but having read the tributes written following her untimely passing, I know I would have enjoyed meeting her. She combined the great intellect and a passion for our region, a passion that I truly share. I'm also struck by her keen interest in many other challenged regions around the world. Rahmatullah It's also a privilege for me to be here with you at AUC, a true center of excellence. In particular, I'm mindful of the Gerhard Center's work on philanthropy and the NGO world, for reasons I'll outline later. AUC's work is important not only in Egypt, but throughout the Arab world. What better example of the value of what high quality education can bring? This lecture series has featured prominent experts across a range of fields, but I believe I'm the first business person to receive this honor. And as a businesswoman with a passion for the Arab world, that gives me the opportunity to offer you a perspective on the challenges we face, on the vision that we need, and the kind of action we must take. Back in 2004, I was asked to share my vision for my own country, Saudi Arabia, a vision that comprised a prosperous and diversified economy, one in which any citizen, irrespective of gender, can find a job in the field for which he or she is best qualified. A vision of a thriving middle class where everyone can feel safe and where all can enjoy an atmosphere of tolerance and mutual respect. Today, that remains my vision. Yes, it's a work in progress, but we are progressing. The Vision 2030 plan championed by our Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, setting out a bolder strategy for the country is central to that. My vision for the broader Arab world is not much different. But to achieve it, there are many challenges we must rec recognize and overcome. 85 million Arabs are illiterate. That is one in five people. 115 million Arabs, almost a quarter of the Arab population, live in poverty. 38 million of those, that is one one in 10 live in acute poverty. That's an increase of 80% since 2010. 50% of the world's refugees are Arabs. And 40% of our children did not attend school in 2015. On the other side, Patent registration, which is a useful indicator of success. I'd like to give a comparison here with another country. Korea, that has a population of 52 million people, has registered more than 82,500 patents. Here in the Arab world, where we are a population of 422 million, we only registered 8,400 patents. So eight times the population, but we registered 90% less patents. We have 5.5% of the world population, and yet more than 35% of the world's terrorist attacks occurred in Arab countries. 
and we lead the world in economic inequality. In 2016, the top 1% of our population earned more than a quarter of our income. The top 10% of our population earned 60% of our income. Now, you might question whether there is such a thing as an Arab world. Our communities are hugely diverse, and there is much that divides us, but there is also so much that unites us, that binds us together, not just in terms of language, tradition, and culture, but also in terms of the challenges we face. We face high birth rates across our region, imbalances in our economic diversification and development, high unemployment, educational systems that are not fit for purpose, frustrating bureaucracy, and ongoing struggles with integrating women into business and political life. Regrettably, a few years ago, the economist referred to the tragedy of the Arabs. But what really caught my eye was the subtitle, a civilization that used to lead the world is now in ruins. And only the locals can rebuild it. This subtitle both depressed and inspired me. But I agree with it wholeheartedly. So we know that statistics tell a tragedy, tragic story, but it wasn't so. That same Economist article pointed out what we all know. Once there was a time when Baghdad, Dimashq, Al Qahira were the jewels of civilization. Far, far ahead of the West, in science, in math, in medicine, and in culture. There was a, a time when Islam and innovation were twins. Today, the position could hardly be more different. We could spend hours debating how we got to be in this, in this position. Many of our national states are immature, and some have failed. We suffered the effect of colonization. More recently, the US and other world powers have interfered, but refused to own it when they broke it. Liberal economies were strangled by state preference for a controlled economy. And we have been too willing to tolerate corrupt leadership, often in return for the promise of security. There is some truth to all of these things, but we must also take responsibility. For too long, we look we basked in past glory and achievements. We believed we were somehow special. There were no lessons to be learned from the rest of the world. But as a businesswoman, I think there are valuable lessons to be learned. There's also inspiration to be gained from elsewhere. The blame game won't move us forward. We need to stop playing that game. It certainly does not help us advance, and in many ways, it holds us back. What we need is action. Take, for example, Singapore, a British colony until 1959. On declaring independence, you could best describe Singapore as small, poor, and tropical, a swamp limited natural resources, little fresh water, rapid population growth, substandard housing, and chronic conflict within their society. There was no compulsory education, few skilled workers, and even fewer college graduates. And tension simmered within neighbors. Sounds familiar? What's more, most of Singapore's food, water, and energy had to be imported. Look at Singapore today, unrecognizably different. 
Much of the success can be attributed to Singapore's first Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew. He set out a clear vision and a rigorous process designed to make that vision a reality. In just 40 years, he made Singapore a true player in the global knowledge economy. With the right vision and approach, what might we achieve here in the Arab world in the next 40 years? When you scratch beneath the surface, Singapore's success story relied on two essential building blocks. First, a commitment to human capital. And second, a commitment to high quality education. The government invested time and money. It worked closely with the private sector to develop a human capital engine by matching supply with demand of the private sector for people with a certain educational background and skills. And right from the outset, Singapore's government had zero tolerance for corruption. What mattered was merit. Other countries soon noticed. We've seen several Gulf countries adopt the model, diversifying their economies, boosting R&D, and targeting education. Dubai was first, and probably the most enthusiastic, under the leadership of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. Other Gulf sun, uh, countries followed. In 2016, as I said earlier, the largest economy in the Arab world and the largest Gulf state, Saudi Arabia, announced one of the boldest efforts to reform under the umbrella of Vision 2030. The strategy is designed to foster economic diversity and growth while galvanizing our youth into our own human capital engine. At the same time, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is pushing hard for greater tolerance and lifestyle improvement for both our Saudi and expat populations. But we still struggle with education reform, and education, and education reform is vital. Think about it. We have an abundance of youth with all the passion, eagerness, and energy which they bring. Young people are literally the future. They are the, ang they are the agents of change. They are also our most precious resource. Only through them can we build the kind of economy and society that can thrive in the 21st century. That's why education is so important. To put this in context, the population of the Arab world increased by 25% between 2006 and 2016. Over 60% of our population is under the age of 30. In Saudi Arabia, by 2030, 50% of our population will be under the age of 25. More than five million young Arabs will enter the labor market every year starting 2020. Now that's a big challenge, but also a great opportunity. But consider this, in 2017, Unemployment among young people stood at 25%. That's double the average of unemployment in the Arab world. Women are three times less likely than men to be in the labor force. They're also twice as likely to be underemployed. So how, how can we be surprised by the wake-up call young people are giving us? We saw it in 2011 with the Arab Spring. We saw their desire, their frustration, their demand for something better. Our young people are calling for the opportunity to contribute because 
For too long, education has been neglected. Our curriculum is often controlled for political purposes. Our teachers are underpaid, and we have paid too little attention to matching our educational system and the skills demanded by the market. Worse still, our economies fail to recognize the value of those highly skilled professionals we do succeed in educating. I'm speaking, of course, of brain drain. In 2014, more than half of all the Arab students who studied abroad did not return home. Half of our students chose to stay abroad. I personally know two young Saudi doctors who had world-class credentials. They returned home and were put on a pay scale far lower than what they were earning overseas and far lower than what foreign colleagues were earning. Not surprisingly, they eventually packed up and left. They now head departments at world-leading hospitals in the US and Canada. What a loss. Others return home and find themselves contending with a public sector bureaucracy that stifles creativity and innovation. An Egyptian woman I read about, Dr. Huda al Maraghi, earned her PhD in Canada. She was the first female in Canada's history to earn a PhD in industrial engineering. But on returning home, she found her experience of Egyptian bureaucracy so stifling that she promptly returned to Canada. That same lady later became the first female dean of engineering at Canadian University, the first female employed as chancellor for the Canadian Ministry of Defense, and the first elected as a fellow in the International Academy for Research Production in Paris. Again, what a loss. And it's a story that is told far too often in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in Iraq, and other countries within the Arab world. Surely, it's time to act. If Singapore can go from being a third world country in 1951 to a first world country in 1999, we can leapfrog too. We have the opportunity to take our educational system from one that lags far behind to one that equips our youth for the challenges of the fourth industrial revolution. Far too many of our young people for too many of our young people, choices in education are few and far between. Some do not have access to even basic program. Those are the 13.7, almost 14 million Arab children who did not attend school in 2015. We are on the very risk of a lost generation. I hardly need to remind us that if we deny a person opportunity, if we strangle their ambition and trample their dreams, they become vulnerable to exploitation and extremism. We have a responsibility to address this issue for the sake of all our children, but especially our refugee and impo impoverished children, because they are truly all our children. Turning to that refugee issue, Lebanon and Jordan continue to struggle, as you know, with an extraordinary influx. NGOs have an important role to play, especially in filling the gaps that exist in our public sector services. These organizations need encouragement and support from the state. Too often, NGOs and charities are stifled by bureaucracy. Where they do exist, better collaboration is needed between NGOs so we can build and deliver better programs. I'm actually here in Cairo 
as Dr. Riccioni had mentioned, with, with other members of the board of Alfanar, the Arab world's first venture philanthropy organization. Alfanar actually started here in Egypt in 2004, and we have a number of very successful investments and in partnership, both here and in Lebanon. And we spent the last two days visiting some of our great investments here in, in Egypt. But as an NGO, our biggest problem is fundraising within the Arab world. Tax benefits in the West encourage greater giving, but incentives in our region are weak. I know of cases where people in the Arab world have turned down funding requests from charities, saying they already have paid their zakat for the year, even though they could easily pay more. We all know that the private sector is more efficient in running investment. This is at the heart of the PPP, private-public partnerships, and also at the heart of privatization programs of many of our governments. So greater cooperation between governments and the private sector would provide a huge boost for our social welfare programs. What better way to start than by focusing on social impact? If we follow the model of best in class countries, we could allow, actually encourage companies to allocate a percentage of their zakat payment to meet agreed social needs in education, health or housing. They fall within the categories mandated for zakat, supporting the poor, supporting the needy and the disadvantaged. Some governments even match corporate and individual donations to further encourage philanthropy. The Singapore government, for example, more than doubles a contribution. This results in social support programs being better supported, more targeted, and more impactful. It certainly gives a better return on investment. I'm so convinced of the benefits of this approach that I've raised this in my own country. The possibility of adopting a new approach for corporate zakat assessment. Perhaps this might be a research topic for the Gerhard Center, exploring and integrating the social, governmental, and relig religious aspects of zakat-based philanthropy. AUC is already very active in researching fundraising in the NGO and charity sector. However things play out, I very much hope that AUC existing research proves correct and that we see a greater willingness to support charitable endeavors in the future than we have in the past. It's, sure, it's surely ironic that AUC and AUB, two of the oldest educational centers of excellence in the Arab world, were founded and funded by American missionaries and donors. We need more centers of excellence like this across the Arab world. Thankfully, several Gulf countries have invested in them recently, but we need more founded and funded by Arab champions. And it's not as if we don't know the recipe for success when building of center of excellence. First, you need a multidisciplinary approach. Second, an organization based on merit. Third, an environment in which ideas can flow, where people are encouraged to push the envelope and no one is afraid to fail. And finally, the cultivation of what the president of MIT, Dr. Raphael Reif, describes as an ecosystem, engaging the full spectrum of stakeholders, both from academia and from the public life. Speaking as a business person, I absolutely believe that the private sector has an important role to play, 
particularly in defining the skill sets we need our academic institutions to foster. Only in that we can develop the skills of our youth to be competitive in a global economy. Equally, we business people like to know that our return, what our return will be. The good news is that this is really easily demonstrated. Just let's look at MIT and Stanford. MIT's living alumni alone have created more than 26,000 active companies. That's more than 3.3 million jobs driving global annual revenue of more than $2 trillion. That's equivalent to the 11th largest economy in the world, right after India and on par with Canada. Not a bad outcome for a single university. Meanwhile, over in Stanford, an institution founded 120 years ago, alumni have created even more businesses, employing more people with even higher revenues. What's more, they have created 30,000 nonprofit organizations. Or consider the importance of R&D, research and development. In North America, Europe and Singapore, 2.2% of GDP is invested in research and development. In Egypt, it's 0.6%. In Saudi Arabia, it's 0.7%. And the UAE is similar. All the Arab countries are under 1%. More than 40% of the world's researchers are in North American and Western Europe. 36% are in East Asia. Just 2% are here in the Arab world. Just think of the competitive advantage that gives to other parts of the world. But the good news is that this can change. Consider what KAUST, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, has achieved in just six years. 320 inventions and disclosures and 219 patents. This shows what's possible. Obviously, we must invest more in research and development. It's no coincidence that when he founded KAUST. King Abdullah stated his goal of creating a new Dar al-Hikmah to return the Arab world to some of its former glory. There is no question that the investment made to establish, nurture, and sustain centers of excellence give a great return, benefiting us all. Centers of excellence also provide equal opportunities in math, science, and technology, not just for men, but for women too. Opportunities afforded women lag behind in so many sectors. So it's right that we work hard to integrate women into the business and political arena, not just because it's the right thing to do, after all, no country can afford to exclude half its population, but also because it's in all our interests to do so. Studies have shown greater and more rapid development of countries when females play a role in the workforce and increased profitability when they enter the boardroom. I realize there is much that I've said that you all already know. There are issues that have been discussed in length in our coffee shops over dinner and at conferences for years. We Arabs love to talk about them and foreigners will happily join us in bemoaning our fate and reminding us all of the things we should be doing. Until now, we've just muddled on. But I'm afraid that in the future, this approach, this mindset won't serve us. Not if we want a better future for our young people. 
our youth want to wait much longer for us to do the right thing. They aspire to something better. So if we're serious about, about holding the fabric of our societies together, we must extend opportunity to the next generation. The promise of possibility, the chance of a better future, those are the lessons of the Arab Springs, lessons we ignore at our peril. For my part, I remain optimistic. I believe we can deliver on those lessons. We can educate our youth to prepare them for the job market and at the same time educate them to value a society where mutual respect and tolerance exist amongst all its citizens, residents and visitors, regardless of social class, religion or gender. That was certainly a core value for me when growing up in Beirut. My father moved us there so my sisters and I could get an education since there were really no schools at that time for girls in Saudi Arabia. In my neighborhood and in my school, we had every Christian and Muslim sect represented. I was unaware that there might be difference. It simply didn't matter. Amongst the things I recall from clearly from my childhood in Beirut was how important made in America and made in Germany were. At the time, the best consumer products meant German or American. Only a Grand Deek TV or a General Motor card would do. Two decades later, the best meant Japanese a Sony and a Toyota. Two decades after that, the best meant Koreans, Samsung. If, at least, if, if you're serious about the quality of the television. What if in 20 years, 40 years from now, the best was meant an Arab made? What if our children were to reap the rewards of investments we made today in education, in research and development, and in innovation. What if the day were to come when all our youth wore the Arab world as a badge of pride? Our young people deserve that. Our duty is to find the strength to deliver that. Some will think it's fanciful, Others naive, others will think it's just hopeless. But, uh, but as others have said, the distance between dreams and reality is called action. Now is the time to act, to act in concert, to create demand for a new mark of quality made in Arabia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Olayan, for the inspiring speech. And now we will open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, the student ambassadors are here to hand you the mics. We'll, uh, the first question goes to Malak Fouad. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Ola, thank you so much for a very um, interesting, depressing, challenging, uh, and hopeful speech. Um, I think we all have a lot to think about. Um, I'd like just to ask you, if possible, um, if you were to pick out one of the elements as your first step for action of the, el of the challenges you raised today, which would it be? Would you begin with education as a first step? Uh, would you begin with political reform? Uh, how would you approach it as a first step? For me, most definitely education. Education, education. Investing in our people. 
that is for me, that is for me the first step, really. And I think when we educate our youth, when we give them the right education, the quality education, the, the ability to challenge respectfully, things will follow. Would you recommend uh, investments into vocational training as, a, as an important foundation? Uh, vocational training is, is a must in every society. I mean, not everyone is going to, and there is plenty of uh, areas, uh, and I mean, in Saudi Arabia, there are many uh, vocational schools, but I think there is sometimes resistance to joining vocational schools. So you also have to work on the mindset. You also have to make vocational school as an attractive pay. In Germany, in Singapore, vocational graduates and people who work in vocational schools can get a, almost a salary, I mean, once they perform, obviously, a salary equal to a university ed uh, educated person. So definitely both tracks are needed. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very inspiring speech. <clears throat> now, Saudi Arabia is going through a sea change. And uh, it is often said that women in Saudi Arabia were the, probably the most disadvantage in the past. How do you see the present and the future prospect for women in Saudi Arabia today? For women? Women in Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, I will tell you, um, we have more women graduating from universities than men. Uh, in terms of academics, the women are uh, ahead in some ways to them. We have more female doctors at, uh, uh, graduating than men. The prospects have tremendously changed since I joined the workforce. There is no doubt about it. In our company now, we have more than 500 women working in the company. So things are changing slowly but changing. Unemployment for women is very high in Saudi Arabia. We have 30% unemployment for women in Saudi Arabia versus 12% for, uh, 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 for, actually even less for uh, uh, men. The average is 12%. So we have challenges, and I have to say the Crown Prince is really uh, targeting this and trying to uh, change the uh, works, uh, work environment for women in Saudi Arabia. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, I wonder if you feel that the lack of birth control, no. the lack of birth control in most of our region's countries is part of the problem. And if it is, how can it be made part of a solution? Mm. Because it's such a delicate Issue. Mm. I would still go after it with education because I think if, let me, uh, you, your question was birth control and how do you tackle that, right? Is that, yeah. I, I would say that might be a little bit too sensitive, but I truly believe that if you educate women, open the workforce for them, that I think is a better way for. Uh, uh, dealing with many of our problems. Good evening. Thank you very much for your valuable uh, lecture. My name is Ahmed Mahmoud. I work for Ahram Online. Well, I, I have just a simple question. W why is it uh, written CEO and Deputy Chairman, not Chairwoman? I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, th this is. No, I want to tell you. <laughs> I am. I, am, I really don't mind, and it is chairman, this is the title 
that actually when my father gave me that title, we, we, we asked, should we do a chairwoman, chairman, and all of this? And we looked at it as one person. For me, I don't mind, but I can see your point. There was a question there. Um, yes, hi. Um, my name is Nadariz, I'm a student here. And um, you mentioned a lot, thank you for being here, first thank of all. Um, it was a beautiful speech. Um, you mentioned earlier that education is key for the growth and civilization of any country or um, continent. Um, you also mentioned that it, it increases diversity and makes you challenge, you know, the ways that we're thinking. What if the ways that, we're, that they're teaching us are very limiting and um, uh, it kind of forces us to be somewhat compliant? How do we... How do we do that? <laughs> I think that is part of our problem, is that the quality of education. By the way, we spend a lot of money on, if you look at the government within the budgets and you see what percentage of the government is spent on education, it's a large percentage. I believe Saudi Arabia is 23%. I don't know what it is here in Egypt of the total budget, but it is. The problem is it's not in the right quality that we should be spending it. And I think there is a recognition that what we have been doing has not been the right way and that we should move, move along. But that is where you want the leadership really to recognize it. You want to retrain the teachers. There's a, there has to be a commitment from the top, from the leaders, to tackle this issue. And we, the private sector, I'm not going to say the students, we, the private sector, have to push for that. Thank you. <clears throat> My question is, uh, if you happen to have a certain amount of intelligent people in your uh, quartier général, and you've had them for a long time, they're signing, they come as if they're present, but they are not doing anything. So you realize you want them out. You're ready to pay them off for them to stay at home. How would you tackle that? How would you see a solution for, for this happening without them rioting and upsetting your business? Thank you. So I guess the question is, how would you tackle uh, uh, bad performers and if they've been a drain on you? Uh, I mean, first of all, you have to follow the labor laws wherever it is, but I guess each company has its own policies. What we have seen in many countries uh, is that you set a certain amount for termination benefits, you set the pool, and you just incentivize them to leave. If they've been there for long, encourage early retirement, pay them out. But it is important to get rid of people who are gonna be draining you because that will affect the morale. I'm involved, I'm on the board of uh, uh, a company that almost had to cut its uh, workforce by 50%, not because they were bad performers, but because the business have dropped and they had to act very quickly. Of course, you start first with your lower performance, but then you move. Unfortunately, it's a reality, and I have to tell you, as CEO, I would think this would be the worst decisions that I would struggle with the most. But you have, in order to save the company, you would have to do the hurtful thing. But you have to do it with kindness. Um, okay, hello, over here. Ah, sorry. Hi, okay. Hi. Um, so I just to get this clear. You were saying that the elite, the private sector, should pitch in to help um, educate the less fortunate. My question is, why shouldn't, why is it the elite's job and not the government? No, if you remember, I said it's a PPP, it's a private public sector effort. It's, 
What I'm saying is both the private sector and the government has to work together on that. It's not, <clears throat> uh, the government definitely has the responsibility and if the governments are capable of it, and I'm not here criticizing anyone, by all means. But if we, c the private sector can help, then that is our responsibility. That is what I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier your comments about the contribution or the participation among the very wealthy in picking up some of the social responsibilities. We see that much more in the U.S., where many of the billionaires have contributed or at least bequeathed a substantial part of their fortune to charity. Uh, we don't see that as much in the region. Do you think that's attributable more cultural, uh, or is it perhaps the perception of the American billionaires of sense of stability in their societies, that they can give away half their fortune rather than give it to their kids? Or is it the estate tax that forces them to give a large part of it away? I think it's a combination of all, and that is what I was referring to. Uh, I think uh, the mindset in the West has always been that of giving and uh, f uh, financially, and of course, that's what I was referring to. There is also the tax element is a big encouragement for that. Actually, I was asking uh, here in Egypt, what is <clears throat> the, uh, what percentage of the tax is deductible for giving? And I was told 10%. Um, in, in my part of the world, in, in Saudi Arabia, we have zakat for Saudis and tax for non-Saudis, and we have zero incentives in terms of that. So I think, and that is what I was referring to, if there is uh, an encouragement from the government to add more. But what is even better is what I've done some research is some countries, as I, as I was mentioning, Singapore, and there are others who do it even more. They match what the private sector is gonna do. So if you wanna donate, if you wanna give 10 million, they will match you. Some countries, in order to encourage this mindset, give you two and a half times for certain causes. So that is where also I think there has to be more private sector, public sector collaboration in giving. And I think the more it happens, the more it becomes part of the tradition and the culture and it becomes an ongoing thing. But the West started much earlier than us. We, in our mindset, we were always dependent on the government. The government gives us everything. Universe. So now we have to start thinking of, you know, the private sector is stronger, economies are trying to, I mean, even the Gulf countries are trying to move away from an oil-based economy to asking the private sector to give more into that burden. So that is why it's that trend I see it coming in the future. Uh, my name is Nadal Garhi, I'm a student here. Um, I want to thank you first for the speech, it was very inspiring. Um, I want to ask first that, uh, what would you advise for a current student, for so someone who still didn't go into the workforce, how would you inspire them and tell them to, like, for a change? Because, like, as we know, education might be limited. And what would you advise them to, to do to help create a better change for themselves, for their generation, and for the future generation? Uh, at the end, I didn't hear the part, but uh, uh, if you can... Like, uh, my question is, what would you tell for current students, for generations who still didn't go in the workforce yet, how, what would you advise them to uh, do to help uh, change their, uh, like, to, change, to do a better change for themselves and for, for future? Uh, if, the, if the question is on the workforce or how to further educate, but I'm a strong believer that you should follow your passion and you should go for what you enjoy doing and follow what you think you're good at. Now, now, now if you don't know what it is you like, then it might be to choose a first... I mean, I'll give you an example about me. I joined a bank 
when I first, it wasn't my first choice. I joined the bank and uh, in working with the bank, I, I spent two years and I have to say, I learned a lot, it wasn't fun, but at least I knew what I liked and what I didn't like. The problem, I'm the mother of three girls and I would have to say the problem with youth is impatience. And, and I see you don't have the time and the patience to stay in something to see whether, I don't like to generalize, so, but overall that's uh, uh, something that I've noticed. Is, so uh, is give it a shot, see w what it is you are enjoying or not enjoying and find out what you like. But everyone can be, perform the best when they're really passionate about what they're doing. And you have to find your passion. Hi, uh, I'm Mohamed Shalani, a student here. And I have um, a question regarding the spike of number of startups we have currently in the Arab region. Uh, we have a, a huge increase in the number of small startups we have, especially in the tech uh, sector. Do you think that this would be enough to uh, maybe trigger change or development in the region? Or do you think that this development would rely more, would need more, uh, maybe manufacturing power or something like a big corporations to do that? No, I think startups and tech are, are the future. And I think, I'm, I'm really impressed by what young people are doing. And you have to uh, understand that, you know, sometimes these small tech companies grow up to become the biggest success in, in the world and, and sell to another company for unbelievable. So no, uh, I mean, that is the, the magic of youth, your innovation, your, your by all means, what, we don't have enough of is the venture capital market, the venture money, the seed money for this. But I have to tell you, it is improving. I'm, I'm seeing it, it, it is in improving. I, uh, and so, uh, and there are many programs in different parts of the Gulf. I don't know much about Egypt, but I'm sure it exists here as well, is to encourage the youth in innovation and tech and put seed money. I have to say, I'm, I mean, uh, uh, if you look at Kareem, if you look at Angami, and if you look at many of these young tech things, which maybe are following some uh, of the other concepts started outside, but they really have made it very big. So that is, for me, is the right way the youth is, is a great path for you to take. I'm an alumni, and uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, as a vision for the rising Arab generation, if what do you think of the role of the social media uh, in the future? For example, as a po in the job market, possible solutions uh, that can uh, rise, or you know, and for the so social media, for the internet, for that that world, how do you think it can be used? Uh, in the process of, you know, developing uh, or s possible solutions for problems that we have in the Arab world. Thank you. Well, the social media has transformed a lot of the Arab world. I mean, uh, I think uh, our Arab Spring wouldn't have happened without the social media. So, but if you're, you're asking me about employment in the social media or... I mean, social media now, uh, I'm, I'm not a great part of it, but I have to tell you, everyone is using it for marketing, sending you business proposals. I receive CVs on WhatsApp. I receive business proposals. Is what's, it doesn't work for me, but I'm sure it works for all, uh, uh, for all the youth. Uh, so it depends how active are you in the social media, but obviously there is uh, plenty of opportunities and a big possibilities in the social media. Um, hi, um, my name is Roxanne. And um, I heard you speak in your um, speech about, um, well, there was, um, th or in, there was a lot of development, or women helped develop, um, or women are needed to develop the world, or, you know, in the Arab Spring, or they helped um, in a lot of countries like that. And I'm wondering, like, what you think of the women or feminism in the Arab world and how that kind of 
how women can participate in sort of becoming in the workforce. I know it's some sort of, it's a big issue around the world. And so um, I'm wondering not only like how you accomplished this, but how um, in the future women in the Arab world can do this. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm a believer in equal rights and, you know, having the opportunity for both. And as I said in my vision, that uh, irrespective of gender, people should be able and should be given the opportunity to achieve what they believe they're capable of or what they can without going whether a male or a female. We have underrepresentation in the Arab world of female in the workforce. But by the way, this is not a problem for us in the Arab world. If you look in, uh, in the US, where the number of CEOs is on the top uh, uh, 100 companies, you would be in a single digit number. So it's not a common problem we are in, in the infancy. Even if you look at board repre representation, there is also still a lag there. So that is something that we have to tackle in the Arab world, we are tackling it. The good thi thing is there are indices done by many organizations, World Economic Forum, UNDP, and all of this that tracks women participation in, uh, in, uh, in the workforce, in uh, politics, and they rank the countries. And I think this is where, you know, we have to monitor the performance of uh, the Arab world in there. We are lagging behind, there is no doubt, but we are moving up the scale. And there is, the good thing is when you're done, you can only go up. So that is what we have to look forward to. Hi, my question is, uh, hello? Yes, sorry. Yes, but it seems, uh, I, hi. Yeah. I just want to ask, what is the timing? Okay, this is the last question, Fadl. It seems that, Kulima, you're, you're saying you can't go down because we're already down, but it seems that we go further down. So what, what makes you optimistic about the air world? Because you've mentioned so many challenges and and I would, love, I would love to hear more about where you think we're going. Are you optimistic about the, air, about our, the future of the, of the Arab world? I, I, I try to be, but are you really optimistic with all of these challenges that, that we're facing? Look, we have unbelievable challenges. There is no doubt about it, and I cited them. And if I gave you a pessimistic view, that wasn't my intention. My intention was to give you a realistic view of where we are. We have challenges, as I have I've said, and in some cases, we are getting worse. But for me, you guys are the future. And this, if we educate you, and you go and you stay here, rather than we have a brain drain, this is why for our company, and I urge, and I see here al Qala, and I see many of the people here, our job is to create an environment where we allow all of you young graduates to stay here, work in this part of the world. And that's why we have to create centers of excellence, not only in university, but in the workforce. <clears throat> I'm more familiar of my country and centers of excellence, so I'm sorry, I'm gonna, for example, Aramco is a center of excellence in my country for workforce. Sabic, Ma'adin, we have many listed companies that are really first class organizations, people where, we, where they want to live. Our challenge, I'll speak about my country in Saudi Arabia, was the social side. It wasn't really, P young people didn't want us, but that is changing. And I'm so happy about Vision 2030 because we do have fantastic companies, but we want to keep our youth by creating the right environment for them to work in and all of this. Look at Dubai. Dubai has attracted so many of the young people from all over the Arab world to work there. And so Qatar is even trying that. UAE, uh, Abu Dhabi is trying that, Saudi Arabia. 
we, we have to create oases in the midst of all this craziness. And I think you in Egypt, you cannot, in Cairo, you will start by creating oases here and there, centers of excellence here. There are fantastic companies that you have that will create and will get the best talents. So, I mean, uh, one statistic I read about, there are three point, I believe 3.3 million Egyptians working in Saudi Arabia, and they're sending to Egypt between 10 to 12 billion dollars a year. That is at least an attraction rather than them, uh, uh, and it's coming to Egypt. So it's our job here is to, and job here I meant the elderly people in the crowd, is to try to create uh, uh, these pockets of centers of excellence for you in order to allow you to join and be creative. And yes, I am not pessimistic about that. I think we have, I'm realistic. There are plenty of challenges, but I think we have great opportunities if we work together and stop this pickering between us. Thank you. So, wow, and mashallah, I will, I think that maybe uh, Nadia Yunus's niece Malik um, captured my own reaction, probably of most of us best, when you pointed out, you spoke with stark honesty and didn't shy from the grim reality, and yet you inspired us with more than hope, with um, Realism and optimism at the same time. I think the young lady who asked the last question asked maybe one of the most penetrating ones. How despite this does one have faith and, and, and hope and sobriety all at the same time? And you captured that. I think your, your statement uh, on centers of excellence captures it for probably all of us in this room who one way or another are engaged with AUC's mission of excellence. I neglected to mention earlier two of your predecessor speakers here have been national leaders of, of Egypt. Um, Dean Fahmi has also, we have, we're coming up on our centenary next year and we've undertaken under his leadership a, almost a breathtaking ambition, an act of faith in the future of a project to uh, replace that UN uh, human development study that you cited some of the facts from with a new one, an updated one, that will be realistic, penetrating, and point the way for uh, the young people that we have in, in this room to follow in your footsteps and in the footsteps of, of Nadia Yunus. You have been inspiring for us this evening um, as a, uh, an Arab, as a woman, as a businesswoman, um, and as a human being exactly as Nadia Yunus, AUC is very proud to uh, continue the tradition this evening of the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture with your contribution. Thank you very much. I have a small, uh, very tiny token of uh, this as a little memento to give you. President Richard Doni, Ms. Olayan, and distinguished guests, thank you for joining us today for the Nadia Yunus Memorial Lecture, and we would like to invite you to our reception outside on the terrace. Thank you very much.